morning, everyone. Oh, well, you guys awake today or what? Ah, a lot of sleepy people today. All right. Well, welcome once again. Good to see all of you. I'm Ben. I'm one of the pastors here, and um, I am glad to be continuing in Philippians today, chapter two. So, if you have your Bible, there's there's Bibles in the backs of the chairs. It'll also be on the screen, so you can just listen along. Uh, welcome again to, to Thomas, and um, remind me of your name, the, the NYU grad student. Uh, Ye- Ye-Jin. Ye-Jin. Uh-huh. Yeah, nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah, welcome. Sorry, I probably mispronounced your name, but yeah, we're glad you're here. Um, so Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit... If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, consider others ahead of yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or attitude as Christ Jesus. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Other translations say something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come before your word today, we pray that you would enlarge our understanding of Christ. Jesus, that we would love you more, that we would see you more clearly, understand more fully the length that you've gone for us, the way you've done for us and laying down your life for us, the great act of humility by which you emptied yourself in power, emptied yourself of your majesty and of your status to come into this world. But I pray for new hope for everybody that's here this morning that needs a word of hope, that needs a word of encouragement. Uh, anybody who is here this morning uh, going through tough times and needing to be assured that God, you can do miracles. And you can bring new life out of death. You answer prayers. So may we see and behold the majesty of the gospel today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just continuing Philippians here. Philippians was a dear friend of the, or sorry, Paul was a dear friend of the Philippian church. So the, the letter to the Philippians is just it's just oozing with his his kindness, his love, his compassion. He really, really loves these people. He had a great relationship with the Philippian church. And so he reaches out to them, and you know the, the impression that you get with, with this particular letter is that Paul is kind of a coach. And he sees himself as further down along the, the line of, of the walk in Christ, or even he's going to call it a race later, it's like a marathon. He's further along, and so he's looking back to people that are, you know, may, maybe they're on mile 13 when he's on mile 22. And so he's nearing the completion of his journey, but he knows that the Philippian church, they still have a ways to go. And so part of Paul's concern as a coach is that these folks make it. He doesn't want them to, to give out uh, in the end. He doesn't want them to get sidetracked in their, in their Christian life. He wants to be sure that nothing jeopardizes um, their walk. Now, coaches are interesting. You know, I had a coach in high school who she, um, you know, she's older and um, she, wasn't a, she wasn't at the time a runner. She was a, the cross, uh, sorry, the uh, field and track coach. But... The thing is, she knew running really well, and she knew about uh, taking care of your body really well. And I remember to this day going to the park and running repeat 400s, and she was there with the timer right at the start line, kind of yelling at us to, to move it and teaching us about how to, how to run at a good pace. We were training for the mile at the time, and that was my freshman year in high school, but that was the, fa- the, the fastest I ever ran a mile was my freshman year of high school, was with this particular coach. Now, she wasn't, she wasn't a runner herself at the time, right? So that's a little bit different when you have a coach who's not doing what you're doing. But see, in the case of Paul, he's actually, he's doing what they're doing. He's further along. He's suffering. He's being persecuted. He's living out his faith. He's being faithful. So in a way, it reminds me of this other, this other coach. I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a cyclist, 
as, as you know. And uh, back in the day, before I had kids, I was really a cyclist. And um, I remember that I was, I was riding with a buddy of mine who was in a, a development team. And uh, this team had like a really serious coach. And his name was Alex Astroy. And Alex Astroy was this wiry, gnarly dude who was probably 10 years older than me, but man, he was so fast and so in shape. He's one, he's one of those kind of guys where you're, you're cranking up a hill and you're, you're dying, you can barely breathe, and he's just kind of talking normally because he was in such good shape. And I kid you not, the first time I met him, uh, and I wasn't even on this team, mind you, but the first time I met him, he was correcting my riding posture. And he told me, he's like, you're not sitting correctly on your, on your bike seat. I'm like, you know, what, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you have, you have to really get down, you know, get down on the seat. Your, your back has to be horizontal. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm about as far down as I can get. He's like, you got to get down further. I'm like, I can't. I got my, my gut, you know, my gut here is being pushed up. And he's like, well, you got to do something about that gut then. <laughs> this is the first time I met him. And I'm like, okay, okay. And he's like, yeah, you need to change your diet. He's like, have you heard of the paleo diet? So paleo was new at the time. So. So this man was correcting my riding posture, my technique, the first time I met him. But the thing was, you know, I took him seriously because uh, he himself was a, you know, an avid cyclist and he knew what he was talking about and he was developing this team. So, uh, so this is Paul, okay? He, he's the experienced one, he's leading the pack, he's, he's teaching them, showing them, he cares about them, he doesn't want them to fall away. And there's really two things that um, he's particularly concerned about in the Philippian church. For the most part, they're doing well, but he's very concerned about unity in the church. He's concerned that um, there, there, we, you'll find out later, either myself or Pastor Jesse are going to share with you, there's some big bickering and, and quarreling that's happening in the church. So, which is interesting because, you know, it's not surprising, but even a, even a really good church, even a really successful, thriving church still has situations where you have, you know, you have people who are a little prideful, people who are a little stuck up, people who think that they're better than others in the congregation. And he's very concerned about this because he knows that this could cause, uh, this could cause divisions. And so he wants them to, to stay the course and, and to, to continue to, to love each other, to care for each other, to be humble. And the other thing that he's going to be writing about is, of course, he doesn't want them to, to miss the gospel. He doesn't want them to, to stray away from the gospel. So, so apparently some people have come in and they're, they're teaching a false gospel. And, um, and so he's going to be correcting that. But today we're really, we're really getting to um, what he's really focusing on in this passage. And this is one of the most beautiful passages in the whole New Testament that describes Christ. Many people think that verses uh, 5 through 11 are almost a kind of New Testament ancient psalm. And scholars are divided about whether that's actually the case. Did, was, did Paul just sort of slip into this eloquent kind of um, narrative of, of who Christ was? Because there's a kind of poetic quality to it uh, and a kind of ring to it. You know? Who being in be very nature God did not consider equality God with something to be grasped, but instead made himself nothing. I mean, it just kind of has that, that kind of song-like feel to it. But other, other, scholars, uh, you know, other scholars say that this is, this, is just how, um, this is just how he's talking. But... Uh, his concern here is about the life of the community, and it's about how this, this fledgling church in Philippi, which is ancient Greece, how they're getting along, how they're getting along, how are they um, operating together as a community. And I think that we would all agree that community is one of those things that we desperately want. I bet if I were to ask for a show of hands of how many of you feel like you have sufficient levels of community and belonging and friendship in your life and you don't need any more, right? probably not many of you would raise your hand. I think a lot of us, we, we want more community. We want more belonging. We want more connectedness. Uh, we want to feel like people have our back. We want to feel like we have a support network. Like if the floor were to drop out, I have people. I have people that are going to come to my assistance. I have people that are going to, you know, keep me from, uh, from, from the worst case scenario of my life falling, falling apart. But many of us lack that. And the question is, well, why, why do we lack that? And the, the fact of the matter is that what Paul is, is promoting in here is, is much more Eastern in terms of a collectivist kind of mentality of what it means to be a, a, together in community, rather than what we have here in, in Western culture, which is much more individualistic. So in Western society, we, we value autonomy and independence, right? In Western society, if, if I have a problem and I come to you with a need, I'm almost embarrassed to even have to come to you because I'd much rather be able to just deal with my problems on my own. Uh, on top of that, we live in a high, highly mobile society where people are moving around constantly, 
And we are also told that no matter what, you need to pursue your own vision for your life and your own dream. And so we're radically, radically uh, self, self-centered self and, and uh, taught by the culture to be completely self-oriented in terms of pursuing your vision for your life, which sounds great, but the, 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 the downside of that is that we are fractured as a, as a community. And so the question, I think, is are we really, we want community, we want belonging, but are we really willing to lay aside our independence? Are we willing to lay aside our autonomy? And are we really willing to make the, the changes necessary to be connected and to have relationships with each other, the kind that can be life-giving and the kind that, that Paul wants to have in the church? You know, I heard a crazy story on a podcast just this week by, um, oh my goodness, what's his name? Pastor, he's a p- pastor in Portland, Oregon. But he was telling me about a commitment that they have. I, sh- I shared the podcast with Christine. Uh, he, was, he was sharing about um, you know the kind of community that he has in Portland, where he's with a group of pastors, and they're committed to doing life together. And they also are committed to having a kind of openness in their lives, where if they spend over a certain amount of money, they have to actually talk it over with the group before they make any kind of a purchase over a certain amount of money. That's, that's far out, right? I mean, how, how many of you would you know, put that kind of a provision in your life where you say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to radically limit myself and I'm going to bring accountability into my life because I want to be doing life with people. People talk about wanting to do life. People talk about it all the time. We want to be connected. We want to be doing life together. Really, are you really, you know, how far will you go? And would you be willing to, to be transparent about your checkbook and your bank accounts? You know, it, it comes at a cost. Uh, people oftentimes complain, they've been at the church for like six months, and they're like, you know, I don't really have a sense of family. I wish I had a sense of family. What's the matter with this church? They, you know, I'm not making the friendships and the connections. There's an expectation that you could be going to a church for six months or something, and, um, and that after six months, you would, you would have whatever that, that feeling was. I'm just thinking, well, you've been there six months. You know, compared to like GFC, right, folks at this congregation, you want to have a sense of family, and people at GFC, I think, a lot of the time, they, they have a really terrific sense of family. And we experience that. Why? Because they've been going here their entire lives. Because their parents grew up at this church. Because their grandparents went to this church. You see, you see, the, you see the difference? We, we move around, we uproot ourselves constantly, and yet we regret and, and we're disappointed that we don't have that level of connection, that level of family. So you just got here, you know? Wait, wait a minute, live it out for a little while and see if maybe, you know, if you put down roots and if you show up and if you love people and wait for that community feeling to come uh, after time, I think it would, but uh, the thing is that oftentimes we are not patient enough. So Paul is, I think, um, he is presenting... A, a, an image of community that's beautiful. It's an image of community that I think we want. It's a, it's a picture of community that will be glorifying to God and will get the job done when it comes to living and embracing the gospel and sharing the gospel with the world in a way that will be effective. But, 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 uh, it all comes down to uh, in the individual question of whether or not you and I can lay aside our own personal agendas and our own desires for ourselves and say, you know what? Right, I'm gonna put this group first. I'm gonna put the body of Christ ahead of myself. And that's a that's a tough question. You know, would we really do that? Is it worth it? Um, and that brings us to the passage today, in which Paul's gonna be describing exactly why that should be something that we would consider doing. So take a look at the first couple of verses, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. So he, uh, he starts off verse 1 with a series of questions, if you have any encouragement. And the assumption behind each of these is yes, you do. Do you guys have any encouragement from being united with Christ. Everybody say yes. Yes, Yes, of course you do. How could you not? You're united with the Son of God, right? You're connected to Him by by the Spirit. Is that encouraging? Absolutely, that's encouraging. So I can just imagine the Philippians being like, yeah, okay, we can sign up. We we can sign off on that. Do you have any comfort from the love of God? Everybody says, yes. 
Yes, of course. How could you not be comforted by the love of God? That sounds great, right? God loves us. He accepts us. He's given his life for us. That sounds great. The fact that God cares about, cares about you, cares about me, I can be comforted by that. He says, if any sharing in the Spirit, do we share in the Spirit? Yes, yes we share in the Spirit. Absolutely, right? The Spirit has been poured out on the church. So I can imagine the Philippians say, well, yeah, we, we share in the Spirit. Do we have tenderness and compassion? Sometimes. Sometime. <laughs> That's good. I love the honesty there. Sometimes. Should we, though? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, we should have tenderness and compassion. God has been compassionate to us, so why wouldn't we be compassionate to others? And so, you know, Paul says here, if you have these things, and you say yes to all four, then he says, then make my joy complete. And so Paul, is he's talking as his coach, he's talking as his father figure, and saying, listen, you guys have so much already. God has done so much for you, but you're not quite there yet. Right? You've given your lives to Jesus, you've been growing in your faith, but you haven't arrived, you haven't, meet, met the, you haven't uh, reached the destination quite yet, you need to make my joy complete. He has his hope for them, and what's the hope? The hope is that they would be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind, Do nothing, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility considering others better than themselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. That's a mouthful. But what is he saying? I mean, we, it's basically in four or five different ways, I think he's saying the same thing. Is that your life needs to be about the group. It needs to be about the church community. It needs to be about the mission. That it is so vital for you as a congregation to be united, friends, in heart, mind, and soul. You're united. Um, listen, West, I think uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern cultures that you, you achieve belonging by conforming. So if you want to be a part of the community, that you have to conform. But that's not what he's saying here. He's saying, no, you, you, don't, you don't try to get belonging by conforming. Rather, through Christ, you belong. And so therefore, out of the graciousness of God, of bringing you into his family, pouring out his life for you, therefore you obey. Therefore, you put the, the body of Christ first, which is the church. The alignment of the body of Christ is so critical. I got my, uh, I got my, my, my wheels um, aligned yesterday, and what I learned is that um, one, of my, one of my wheels was less than 0.1% off on an angle, and that was going to destroy the, tile, the, the tire. Less than 0.1% of an angle off was going to wreck my, my brand new tires. So of course I had to pay the 100 bucks or whatever to, to get it. Uh, aligned, if any of you know of a better place that I can take my car to next time, please let me know because I don't want to pay 100 bucks for it. But anyway, for Paul, it's, it's the same thing. This alignment is so incredibly crucial for the church because if the alignment is off by even just a little bit, the church is going gonna, is gonna to completely run amok. And, and Paul's concern is that, um, that if the church is not, does not have this unity, then the church itself will eventually be destroyed. It's going to completely shipwreck. And so he has concern for the church. But another aspect here is that Paul is not only concerned about the church itself, but he's concerned about the witness of the church. He's concerned about the effectiveness of the church in being able to proclaim the gospel to the nations. And what Paul knows, and what I think you and I also know, is that an ununified church is virtually incapable of effectively proclaiming the gospel uh, in the world. You know, one of the, one of the things that, um, that people, when I tell them I'm a, I'm a pastor uh, or a Christian, yeah, what's the first question you think they always ask me? Anybody take a guess? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because everybody expects a pastor to dress in jacket and tie and all those yeah. things. Yeah. So she said that I don't look like a pastor. They used to say that like 10 years ago. They used to say you're too young to be a pastor, but people don't say that to me anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> I miss those days. <laughs> now, what they say is, what denomination are you? They would say, they would want to know, well, okay, so you're a Christian, but what does that mean? We don't know. Why? Well, because you got Catholics, you got Protestants, you got Orthodox, and then among Protestants, you have Baptists, you have Presbyterians, you have Calvinists, you have Reformed people, you have, you know, the, the, whole, the Charismatics, and they go on and on and on and on. 
And so then I'll have to say, well, I'm, I'm reformed. I, I come from this, you know, this history of these Dutch reformed immigrants who came over from the Netherlands and they came to New York and, and then the, their eyes kind of glaze over. And by that point in time, they don't care anymore. You see what I'm saying? The, 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 the body of Christ is so fractured. Uh, and then they want to say, well, what is the difference between, between all the different groups? You know, I think it's laughable to, to the outside world when they, see, when they see what's happened to the church. You know, how can, how can the church be a place that, that proclaims one God, one spirit, one baptism, believes that this God is way, way, way bigger and more important than any one of us, and, said, and yet all of us in the church are acting like we're so important. And we can't even get along. The family of God can't even get along. What does that say about this God? What does that say to the world about this God? Uh, not, not great things, you know. I think it's hard to take the church seriously when there's infighting in the church, when there's bickering in the church. When the church can't get on the same page about what it's here, what it's supposed to be doing, why has God put us here, and what does it mean for us to actually love and take care of each other? You know, how does that reflect well on God? How does that convince the word the, the world? By the way, the world is really not even convinced there is a God. So, if anything, uh, you know that that kind of behavior I think confirms their worst suspicions that it's all just a, a, a fabrication, it's a myth, because the people within the church. They claim that they believe in this all this all powerful supernatural being who loves us and who wants what's best for us, and yet, you know, the the um, you know we can't we can't get past ourselves. So that that's Paul's concern. So what does he say? Um, and this the thing here with this these couple of verses, it's it's so extreme that I think. In our culture, for us to take this seriously, it really, really requires us to dig deep and it, to allow the gospel to challenge, I think, our deepest assumptions, especially living in a, in a Western world, Western individualistic society, where we're, we're so encouraged to self-publish and self-express and be our own person and be independent and make a name for ourselves and self-promote and have your own brand. I mean, these kind of concepts would have been, you know, unfathomable in the first century when this stuff is written. And that's, the, that's the, the, the current we swim in. And yet, you know, what does he say? Be like-minded, have the same love, be one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. So that that is, um, you know, that is an, an incredible challenge for us, especially I think for you, you know, for you who are in the the working world in the marketplace, where so much of getting ahead and succeeding seems to be dependent on being able to sell the best version of yourself. And how do you, you know, I was just talking with my wife about this uh, today, like in the hospital system, where. It seems like people, um, in order to kind of get the jobs done, are, are constantly, uh, you know, self self promoting, listing off all their accomplishments, listing off their status, their ranking, you know, who they know. How do you, as a believer, operate in an environment like that? Right? How do you not? How, how do you play the game, but without getting caught up in that vicious cycle of needing to be conceited, needing to be looking out for yourself? You know, I don't know. I, I, I don't fully know. I think I think those of you who are professionals, you probably have a better sense of that. I think it means really, you know, walking a really tight line. I also think it means oftentimes doing exactly the opposite of what people maybe expect you to do and trusting that God will be the one who elevates you and gives you favor and, and raises you up. Because I think if you just go along with what society is asking, it's, it would be very different from, from what is being suggested here. Uh, very, It would be very different. Um... The church is not primarily, let me just share this, the church is not primarily about group conformity or peer pressure, but it is about humility, it is about mutual submission, it is about prioritizing the group over the individual, it is about singleness of mission, and it is about keeping our eyes on Christ. Um, I think that one of the things that maybe we need to get away from is thinking that for us to have unity in the body of Christ requires that we agree on everything all the time. Uh, that's, you know, that probably will never actually get there, but I don't think that that's actually what Paul is saying. 
I don't think that Paul is saying that for us to have unity in the church requires that we be these like automatons or these robots where we just like say the party line and there's no individuality uh, allowed. There's no uh, diversity encouraged. That's, that's not what Paul is saying. But what Paul is suggesting, I think, is that if there is an attitude and a posture of humility and recognizing that others can come before you and that's okay... And there's a desire that instead of wanting to promote my own agenda, we keep our eyes focused on Christ and promote the agenda of Christ. That somehow naturally through that, through that posture, we have unity. So understand what's being said here. He's not saying we all have to agree on everything all the time. That's not, that's not the point. But he's saying for there to be unity, there needs to be a willingness to put the body of Christ ahead of my own individual pursuits. And I think you see this like if you have a roommate, you know. Uh, living with a roommate kind of is a, is a reality in New York City. Um, and, you know, it often is the case that you're not going to see eye to eye with your roommate all the time. Sometimes your roommate is going to leave a mess and break the rules. Do you have a rule, you have a rule about, like, cleaning up the, the sink in the kitchen, uh, Evan? Yeah. You do. Yeah, so how, how would you feel if, like, one of your roommates just, like, completely left the, the kitchen trashed? I wouldn't like it very much. Yeah, see, yeah, Evan would be pretty unhappy about that, understandably. And maybe there's differences of opinions about the way things should be run, right? If you're going to come in after a certain time, you've got to be really quiet. Well, let's say your roommate comes in at like 12 a.m. They're being loud and obnoxious and they're on their phone. Like that's going to be, you know, that's going to be frustrating. Or maybe they have friends over when you don't want there to be friends over. Um, so the potential for conflict is just, you know, is, is huge in, in a roommate type situation. It's huge in a marriage situation. But if we apply what Paul is saying here, he's not saying you have to agree on everything all the time. He's just saying you need to be humble. Humility is the grease that keeps the wheels of relationship moving. All right? Humility is what, able, what enables us to be able to disagree sometimes, but not to, to stop getting along. Because we're willing to put others first. We're willing to, um, to not always have to have it be our way. And another thing, and before we talk about Christ himself and, and um, you know, the glorious sacrifice that he has made, and that is this, that for Paul, your faith, and your journey with Christ is inseparable from your connection and relationships within the body of Christ. Beyond question, for you to grow in your faith, for you to experience more of God's power in your life, for you to grow to become more of the person that God meant for you to be, for you to experience more of the Spirit's power and working in your life, there's not one of those things that just happens in isolation. That for Paul, you being in Christ and being in the Spirit is like this, with being involved, connected to, integral to the body of Christ. There are no lone range of Christians, somebody said. And that a lot, so much of the work that I think God wants to do in your life and my life has to do exactly where the point of conflict exists in relationships. Because that's the place where God's sanctifying us, changing us, challenging us, um, working out our... Uh, self-centered tendencies or pride, it, it, it's all in the church. It's in the church. So the, the church has this, uh, you know, this pivotal role in making you the person that God desires for you to be. Think about that. And think about how important it is to be a part of the church. We'll keep moving here. Uh, the next section, uh, this is, you know, as I mentioned, this is a kind of a thought to be maybe an early hymn. He says, verse 5, In your relationships with, the, with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So I'll just say there that having the same mindset, right, Paul is saying that your thinking ought to be like Christ. Your attitude, some translations say, say have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. And I think it's worth noting that, you know, we look to Jesus as a Savior. We believe Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. We praise God because we can, you know, be a part of uh, the, the family of God through what Christ has done. But let us never forget that not only is Christ a Savior, but he's also a model for us. And what Paul is trying to do is say, listen, this guy who you worship, it's great that you worship him, it's great that he's, you know, he's glorious for you, you love him, but do you also know that Jesus is the, is the person that we ought to be modeling our lives after? That we ought to be seeking, not necessarily to do all the things that he did. So what we're not saying is that you all need to be itinerant preachers in Palestine. We're not saying that you need to like, take a vow of poverty and, you know, and, and, and just live... Um, you know, wandering around as Jesus did. It's not what's being talked about. But he's saying the mindset of Christ. 
Are we, are we seeking in our walk with Christ to, to, are we even asking the question, how would Jesus approach the situation? You're facing a challenging situation at work. You have a person who's getting on your nerves, who's really bothering you. You have somebody that you're tempted to look down upon, right? Maybe somebody comes up, approaches you asking for money on the street and they're all completely tatted up and they're wearing dirty clothes and you have a, you know, a, a judgment about that person in your mind that happens before you can even think about it. But are you allowing God to say, you know what, I want, I want you to stop judging people and stop thinking about people in the way you would in your flesh and I want you to instead embrace the mind of Christ and think about people the way Christ would in your attitude, in your mindset, in your relationships, that's what he's saying. And then what did Jesus do? So what is this mindset of Christ? Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, or some translations say, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now that word for grasp in the Greek is harpagimam or something like that. You don't need to remember it, but it's a very rare word. It's only used one time in the entire New Testament. Something to grasp. And, and the idea there, is, uh, something to grasp is, you know, if, you're, if you have something that's really good for you and you want to, you wanna, it's like treasure or it's power and, and it benefits you and you want to grab a hold of it and you're not going to let anybody take that from you because, you know, that, that's really good for you. That, that would be something to grasp, right? So, you know, you think about like a, a king or a dictator, right? These, these guys are not going to let anything or anybody, you know, challenge their, uh, their grasp of the, the control and the authority that they, that they have. It's kind of like Mayor Bloomberg, remember, uh, he, he ran two terms and then he was really grasping for a third term. And so he somehow had the city council change the term limit so that he could, he could run a third term and then he was elected for a third term. You guys are not laughing. You didn't think that was funny. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's grasping, okay? That's, that's grasping, holding on to authority. But he says that he did not consider, uh, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now, uh, to understand what's going on here, you know, what you have to realize is that before Jesus was born in this world, he existed. How many knew that? So, before Jesus was born in this world, he existed, he has always existed as the Word of God. John chapter 1 talks about the, you know, the Logos, the Word of God that existed from all eternity with the Father. The, the Son of God was always there as the eternally begotten Son of the Father prior to coming into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. He existed as a spiritual being. You had Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This is the, the teaching of the Trinity uh, that is the Orthodox kind of Christian teaching about the very nature of God. He's co-eternal with God, shared with, with God the Father in majesty. And so that's why it says that um, you know, he, was, he was in nature God. And when it says that he's in nature God, it means he has the nature of God, which is the same thing as saying he is God. Does that, does that make sense? So if, if, if you know, this boy here, Elijah, has the nature of a human, he has a human nature, so then he is a human. So, so, so Jesus, prior to coming into the world, existed as the pre-incarnate. Incarnate means manifested, took on flesh. So Jesus exists pre-incarnately. But what Paul is saying is that this pre-incarnate Son of God, existing with the Father in majesty and in glory, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So the Son of God exists in companionship or partnership with the Father, but He's separate from the Father. I know this is confusing. There's one God, and Scripture teaches, but this God is revealed as three distinct persons. It's the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. So they, share, they all share the nature of God, but they are distinct in personhood. And so that's why it says that the pre-incarnate Son of God did not consider equality with God's enemy ground. He is God. He has the nature of God. He's glorious. He is eternal. He is powerful, right, with the Father. But, and this is the incredible thing about Christ, is that instead of grasping and holding on to his status... He was willing to empty himself and to take on 
the full limitations of being a human being and being born in this world. So it goes on to say, um, rather he made himself nothing. Uh, in the Greek, and if there is, I know I share a lot of Greek sometimes, usually it probably goes in one ear and all, out the other, because it's all Greek to you, but there's a, one word that I, do, that I do want you to remember forever, and that is the word kenosis. Kenosis. And it is the word that is used in verse 7 when it says, He made himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So what is this, what is this, what is this kenosis about? And this is, um, theologians, this is a very dicey passage. Very, it's very difficult. Because the question is, well, did Jesus, when, when this pre-incarnate word, he is God, he exists, he, come in, he comes into the world, he humbles himself, does he stop being God? And the theologians are very, very clear that when Christ comes into the world and he's born, which is what we celebrate on Christmas, that he does not stop being God, right? So Jesus Christ, the, the, the scriptures teach us this and, and theology teaches us, he's fully God and, and fully man. So what does it mean that he emptied himself? What exactly did he empty himself of then? If he didn't empty himself of his divinity, then, then what, well, what happened? Well, what happened was that Jesus, he emptied himself of status. He emptied himself of glory, right? He existed, right, outside of time and space. Time and space is the creator of the universe. God, Jesus, right, the scripture says that through the logos, through the word, the world came into being. So Jesus is outside of the world, but in his kenosis, in his self-emptying, Jesus Christ comes into creation, and not only that, the scripture says he took, he took on flesh. John 1 says he, the, 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 the word became flesh. And so um, it's, it's changed by addition and not by subtraction. So it's not that we lose his divinity. It's that humanity is added to divinity, which for us sounds great because we're humans. We like being human. But if you are if you're the, the unlimited, eternal son of God and you come into the world... That's a condescension. That's a humiliation. Because you are now taking on uh, the human experience. You're becoming completely, fully human in, in every way that, that you or I am. So think about that. God becoming human. Emptying himself. Right? He's born in a, in a stable. He has... Uh, he's poor. There's no Wi-Fi... Or air conditioning, all right. So he's got there's that. No one recognizes. No one. No one recognizes him. Uh, you know, the, part of the emptying is that the the majesty of his divinity, which if it was revealed, would just be so bright it would just blow everybody away. But that's hidden. It's covered in his flesh. So people can't actually see who he is. They, they can't fully recognize him because they're they're fooled by his. His truly human flesh that he wears. Uh, that's part of who he is now. He changes. He changed. So he's going to experience everything that humans experience. He's going to be hot. He's going to be cold. He's going to be hungry. He's going to get sick. He's going to be mistreated. He's going to be you know, bullied. He's going to be persecuted. Um, you know, the only question I suppose is, like, how far will he go in this, this emptying of himself? Now, the reason, you know, people are very clear that, and, and some pastors actually get this wrong. They, they teach that Jesus was, was, was human and that he shed his divinity for the earth, for his earthly period of life. I don't think that's true. Um, he is still fully divine. He just chooses not to use his, his divinity most of the time. Because you do have lots of situations where, in fact, Jesus does use his miraculous power. Like he walks on water and stuff like that. What's up with that? But you also know the situation where... Um, Satan comes to Jesus and tempts him to turn the stones into bread. Right? That's divine power right there. That he has, he has the ability to do that. He could do that if he so cho chose. But that's part of the kenosis. That's part of the emptying. Is that he's not going to use his divine, divine power to, to benefit himself. He's emptying himself of, of, of that power. He's, it, it, it's a kind of self-imposed limiting. In a lot of ways, I think it's like a mother giving birth to a child. Right. You have a young, a, a, you know, a single. Or not, you have a you have a woman who has not had kids. Right, her life is her own. She can do whatever she wants. She works, makes money, has fun, goes out with friends. But then, you know, a woman gives birth to 
a child. And there's a kind of emptying that happens. There's a kind of embracing of humiliation, of limitation. Um, the birth itself, the birth itself, is a is a highly, highly, um, you know, vulnerable experience, where you know, the people in the room and you're had going through a delivery, and it's you're to- completely exposed as a woman. Not only that, but then now you this this new being comes into the world, comes into the into the the world, into the into existence, and now your life consists of breastfeeding and changing diapers and. Lots and lots and lots of limitations. Because now you have a child, you have a person. So could the woman still go out and play and party with her friends? Could she just do her own thing? Well, yeah, she could. But see, that's the motherly instinct, is that, that self-giving, the self-imposed, accepting um, limitations in order to nurture and bring about this new child into the world. And so I think of the kenosis of Christ as like a mother. Um, give, willingly giving up what is his. Um, you know, for the sake of for the sake of us, for the sake of people. Um, the question I, I suppose we could all ask is like, how far would Jesus go with this? Um, there was an author, a journalist named Barbara Ehrenreich, and she wrote a book called Nickel and Dimed. I will admit, I haven't actually read the book, but my wife did, and she told me about it, and I, and I looked it up. But the book was um, was popular because what she did is, that, you know, she's a fairly successful journalist, but she did an experiment, a sociological experiment, whereby she went to a, another another town and got a job just working, you know, minimum wage jobs. And her whole experiment in this book was to see, can I, as a minimum, as a single woman, a minimum wage worker, can I make it in the United States of America? And over the course of the, you know, a couple of months, she worked a handful of jobs, lived in out of, out of hotels, tried to share life with people who were in a similar situation, and come to find out that you absolutely cannot really get by you know, doing what she was trying to do. So the thing was, when she got she got jobs at a waitress, as a waitress, she got a job at, at um, Walmart and stuff like that, people had no idea who she was. They didn't realize she was this, this famous journalist because she was putting on putting on this, this act of being, you know, being a person in that kind of a situation. But when it's done, when the experiment, experiment was done, then Barbara Ehrenreich can just go back home and go back to her, her nice lifestyle. And so that's the question with Jesus. It's like, Jesus, you know, how far are you going to take this? Okay, so you embrace being human. You embrace limitations for, for a time. But Jesus Christ, you know, when, when the going gets tough, and when it comes time for it, things to get really ugly, and for you to suffer significantly, like, yeah, you've been poor, but this is going to get a lot worse than just being poor, right? You're going to be disgraced. You're going to be humiliated. You're going to be falsely accused. You're going to experience all the worst stuff that this world has to offer, Jesus, Son of God, come into this world. Are you gonna Are you gonna go the distance? Are you gonna go that far? And what does the scripture say? Was that He was willing to go the distance and being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. And this is this is the astonishing thing, right? This idea of, of God becoming a servant. So if we hear about servant leadership. Servant leadership is is like a popular kind of. Even in secular leadership, you know, leadership articles and stuff, you read about servant leadership. Um, people, servant leaders are respected because you know they, they are willing to. They, they're not prideful. They're willing to like get their hands dirty. But did you know that that this idea of servant leadership was coined in 1970 by a guy named Greenleaf? Christy, do you remember his first name? Okay, you can look it up. It's Greenleaf. So this has been it's been popularized since the 1970s since he coined the coined the phrase. Listen, in the first century, the idea of a servant leader would have been unthinkable. It would have been ridiculous. We're, the gods don't come and serve us; we serve the gods. The gods are way way high up there. They control everything. Blessing, riches comes from them. We have to we have to humble ourselves before the gods. We have to worship the gods. We have to make sacrifices. For the gods. You see what Paul is saying here? He's saying that's not what God is like. God became a servant for us. God sacrificed himself to bless us. It, it's, it's so profound. It, it's so radical uh, that I think we can miss the significance of, of what Paul is saying. Here we are. And I, I'm sorry, I've gone over. I need to wrap it up. 
<laughs> here we are. We've been, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling. We're trying to get along. We're trying to do church, trying to be the body of Christ. Paul says, you need to stop, you know, get your eyes off yourself. You need to look up and recognize who is this Jesus? What has he done? Pre-incarnate, glorious, the word of God came, made himself a slave. How far would he go? He'd go all the way. He would die. He would give up his life in order to reveal to us the nature of God. And what is the nature of God? God is on the one hand far more glorious and powerful and magnificent than we could possibly imagine. But this same God is a God who's not only willing to get his hands dirty, not only willing to come into our life and experience our lives, experience the pain and suffering that this world has to offer, but would be willing to die on a cross so that we could be set free from sin, sickness, suffering, and broken relationship with God. And Paul is saying, if this is your God, if this is your Savior, then let's get along. Then let's be united. Let's serve each other. God has served us. God has humbled himself before us. We can humble ourselves before each other, put each other first, and be the kind of community that the city needs, that the world needs, that will be able to effectively preach and proclaim the gospel in a way that's really going to change lives. All right? I had more I was going to say. I'll wrap it up there. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you. And I pray about that. By the work of your Spirit, that you would enlarge our understanding of Christ, that you would show us, Lord, what you've done, the length that you've gone in order to show love and compassion to us. Lord, I pray that we would have such an incredible vision of you that you would be so real for us, that each one of us would just come to to know you better, to love you more, to desire to experience you more, to be more intimately connected with you. And I pray that, that through that we would change more and more. Lord, help us to embrace the mind of Christ. Help us to embrace the attitude of Christ. Lord, you gave up everything for us. You went the distance for us. Help us to know how precious we are in your eyes. Each one of us, so precious that you would lay down your life for us. God, forgive us for the times that we we get down on ourselves and we um, sometimes we even we hate ourselves and we live with a lot of regret and shame. And I, I, I say, Lord, to forgive us of that because I know that's not, that's not what you want for us. That's not what, how you want us to think. That's not how you want us to act. We can actually love ourselves because you have loved us. You have considered us worthy of your love because we are your creation. We are your children. And so, Lord, I pray that this love would permeate our lives more and more, that we recognize how true it is that you care for us, that you've made a way for us, watching over us, that you will never, ever let us go. So let's, let's just stand and now we'll worship this God together.